thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, this is part of our continuing occasional series of webinars on different areas of charity research. Uh, I'm Kean Murphy, I'm co-managing director of FP Synergy. And today, obviously, we're going to be talking about uh, an audience of particular interest to most of our clients, uh, that's your own supporters. We're going to have three fantastically interesting sessions this afternoon, I'm sure, so I'm eager to get straight on to them. First, just some quick housekeeping. Uh, first of all, I'm going to record this session, if I can remember how to do that. Um, oh, somebody has already started recording it. Okay, great. This is being recorded, um, so I hope that's okay with everyone. We are going to share it with um, people who, who couldn't make it today. Uh, so I hope that's all right. Second of all, we're going to have questions at the end of each presentation. So if there's something you'd like to say or any kind of a comment or, or question, just save it to the end, please, because there are quite a few of us here. Um, and then we'll, we'll have an opportunity to say that at the the end. Great, so our first speaker is our uh, driver of ideas, I believe still the only person in the sector with that job title, Joe Saxton. Joe's going to be talking about developing a strategy for committed supporters that's based on our research and his years of working uh, and his experience in working in the sector. So take it away, Joe. Okay, uh, thank you, Kin. I'm hoping you can all hear me okay. Um, I won't be <clears throat> monitoring the, the chat, but um, other people uh, I'm hoping will be. Uh, and I'm just going to make my screen large uh, so you can see it. Yeah, so this is uh, a presentation that came out of a couple of conversations with clients actually before Christmas, um, looking at committed giving. It's a really key area, but my sense is actually some of the impetus has gone out of people creating committed giving uh, strategies. Um, and also what seems to be happening is people um, get fixated on one type of committed giving, whether it's membership or uh, direct debits or something else. So what I want to do in this um, presentation is look at the different mechanisms, look at the things that uh, often happen uh, and see uh, uh, what are some of the ways forward. Uh, but first of all, let me give you a definition of, of committed giving and the rationale behind it. So I'm going to give you a definition of individuals who commit to give money or time. And I think it's important uh, that we include time and other mechanisms uh, on a regular, predictable basis. Uh, the reason uh, that people want committed giving is it provides a regular stream of income or resource for the organization. That income is likely to be tax effective. Uh, when the, it's money, uh, it gives the supporter a clear idea of the relationship with the organization uh, and it puts the onus on the supporter to stay committed rather than the other way around. The danger is if you're always just asking for donations, it puts on the onus and the organization to come up with ever new and more ingenious ways to get somebody uh, to, to do something again. Uh, what I want to do next is look at some of our trends from our uh, public awareness tracker CAM. Uh, if you're not part of it, uh, you certainly should be. And I know that many of you on the call are already wise enough to be uh, part of the awareness monitor. But these are some trends going back over the last 10 years to look at how people are, are getting engaged. So here, uh, and actually it looks like a rather boring chart, but I promise you they do get more interesting. Uh, this is from 2011 to, to uh, just at the end of last year. People who have standing orders, people who have membership subscriptions, and people who are payroll giving. And you can see we've got about 20% of the population uh, with standing orders or direct debits, 13% with membership subscriptions, uh, and 3% with payroll giving. But uh, let's drill down into that a bit more. If you then say, OK, but what about the people who are donors? You're taking away the people who actually don't take part at all. Uh, this is just the people who are giving. You can see, not surprisingly, that the, the numbers all go up to some extent. But what you can also see is that standing orders and direct debits uh, appear to have increased in the last year to 18 months, which may be a pandemic effect. Uh, but you can see the tiering remains the same uh, as it was before. Standing orders, top of the tree, then membership subscriptions uh, and then payroll giving. If you, though, ask a slightly different question, which is to uh, be a bit more of a prompted question, are you or have you been uh, a paying member of any of the following? Uh, and what you can see in this mustard line is that the number of people who say none of the above and none of the above is not a professional association, not a charity, not a sports club, not a hobby or special interest uh, uh, group has grown uh, since 2008, where our data goes back to, it's plateaued now. But in other words, we've got a lot less people now than we had a decade ago 
who are part of some kind of membership organization. And you can see the decline of the other parts of those things. So in other words, and any of you who have read uh, Robert Putnam's Bowling Alone will remember his thesis that less people are getting engaged. And this data appears to uh, back that up. Less people are doing some kind of membership. And if I had a basic thesis, it's that membership is less popular, less in the public psyche than it used to be. And what defines membership is also slightly different. And I can talk a bit about that. Uh, if you then look at some of the demographics of those things, what you can see here is the demographics of when we started and we finished. Thanks to my colleague Eva for creating these charts. Uh, you can see the most recent said 41%, uh, and at the beginning of our period, uh, we had 27%. Uh, but what we also have is a fairly strong increase amongst the younger age groups, albeit the sample size is relatively small. Uh, and you can see also we've got uh, a fairly strong increase amongst the C1s. What about membership subscription? And there we get some more interesting changes going on. So although the overall hasn't increased by as much, what you can see is, again, the younger age groups, but note the smaller sample size, uh, appears to have increased fairly dramatically in, in the 10 years. But perhaps most interestingly, the older age groups appear to have decreased in the number who are doing a membership subscription. So this, the question was, which of the following ways do you give? So less people appear to be doing membership than was the case before. But almost all of the over 45s, 55 to 64, pretty even Stevens, and the over 65s decreasing in particular. So some suggestions that actually membership subscription amongst its core heartland has decreased overall. What about if we say uh, those people where we ask them, are you or have you been a paying member of any of the following? And we see a broadly similar pattern. Uh, the uh, younger age groups, we see an increase and the older age groups, we see a decrease. So the pattern here appears to be that the older age groups are falling out of love with being a member. And that's quite a worrying trend because for people at like the National Trust and for RSBB and for so many organizations, this idea of membership is a key part of public life. And if it's not as in favor as it used to be, then what should you be doing if somebody says, if your trustees say, we need members, uh, and perhaps what this uh, is showing is maybe you don't. Uh, payroll giving here, interestingly, uh, an increase in 14, from 4% to 13%. I would take this with a pinch of salt. That would mean we had something like uh, uh, 5 million payroll givers in the UK. Uh, and in fact, in reality, we probably only have more like one or two million. But what it does appear to show is that the younger age groups are much more enamored uh, with payroll giving than the older age groups. And I have to say within our own staff team, that's what we find. It's the younger people who are payroll giving um, and it may be exhibiting enthusiasm. So if you want to get payroll givers, probably the younger age group are the people to go for. OK. What about the types of payroll giving uh, and their pros and cons? Well, let me go through the current offers that there are out there. First of all, there's what I call benefits-led membership. That is, you joined as a member for the benefits you get. National Trust, classic example, this is what National Trust website tells you. You get a free entry, you get free parking, you get a National Trust handbook, uh, you get a cuddly toy, you get all sorts of things if you join uh, to be part of the National uh, Trust. And five million people would say, actually, it can't be all that bad. You then got what I call beliefs-led membership. Uh, Friends of the Earth, as you example, the tangible benefits aren't that big, but you are saying, you know what, uh, this is something I, uh, I believe in what they're doing. I think they're a fantastic organization. You get professional-led membership, uh, which I think is a slightly different uh, issue for this. Hugely important, but actually, by and large, people join them because they're part of the profession, but it's still called membership. And one of the challenges we have is that membership is a term that has all sorts of different uses, and we tend to use it uh, as if it was one uniform, uh, homo homogenous offering, when in reality, they're very different. You then have child sponsorship, hugely popular where it's been working. Uh, that all the organizations I know who do child sponsorship would love to move their their supporters onto something else, but it remains massively popular with a range of people and quite a high tier product, one, probably one of the highest tier committing giving products that we have out there. We then have the three pound a month offer. Here's WaterAid saying, would you like to give us monthly two pounds, five pounds, 10 pounds and so on. Um, uh, and it's a fairly bland, generic offering for most people. Uh, just give it to us. Um, uh, and it's actually quite hard. I'd love any suggestions. Uh, to find people who have branded their three pound a month offering. We then have payroll giving uh, done in this case by CAF uh, and then we have direct debits and standing orders. 
So that's the broad offering of the ways that you can be a committed giving supporter. One of the things to notice is that actually, by and large, they are all about money. If you give 10 hours a week as a, a, a volunteer, there's very little that recognizes you or binds you in or whatever. And that's a shame. We should see an equality of currency. And I'll come on to that. Here are some of the tank traps that the people have in the current offense. The first is the fixed price tank trap. If you have a, a, a cost of X, then all I need to give X. If you tell me membership is 48 pounds a year, I give you 48 pounds a year. Uh, I suggest you go and try and give more money to RSPB or to National Trust than the cost of their membership. Uh, uh, it, it's quite hard work. My dad wanted to, once he loved National Trust, he thought they were fantastic. Uh, and the only way he could work out to give National Trust more money was to buy all of his children membership, which yeah, was great up to a point, but it seemed not quite what their National Trust membership was all about. Um, you then have the menu without prices cop out. Charities say to you, give what you can, but the punters don't want to get it wrong. Just in the same way, most of us would hate to go to a restaurant uh, and discover that actually it had been no prices on the menu. It was whatever we thought we should afford. Uh, actually, people don't like it when it comes to a charity. Either. They need to know what is the right thing to do. And of course, that's why membership is popular. But the danger is somebody who might have given £100 a year only gives you £50 a year because that's what the membership thing says. So, of course, one of the challenges here is that um, the, the tank traps don't all point in the same direction. The spray and pray trap. For all supporters and all motivations, so there's but one way of committing. Uh, so you then link that to what I've called 3B, which is the one to all audiences. In other words, for the entirety of the world of people who want to support you, they have one way of doing it. It has one fixed price. And for all those new types of audiences, people go, oh, we want to reach new audiences. But actually, you have the same basic product. Uh, and that's a real challenge is to know how people respond to that. Uh, the next one on my list is the, what I call the single currency insult. Money is the only way to commit. And I think that's a real shame. Time and campaigning should also count. And actually, it's a good way of uh, tying in volunteers and campaigners to, to say them. Uh, next on my list is the excess baggage barrier. In other words, some people don't particularly want to get all of the things that they have on membership. Uh, so I don't want the, 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 the handbook. I don't want to get all of this paraphernalia. Uh, I once asked RSPB if I could only have two copies of their uh, quite thick magazine. I've now been converted. Of course, I read it religiously every quarter. But uh, I did once ask RSPB if I could only get two a year. And they go, no, you either get nothing or you get four. Uh, so the problem is, actually, we talk about being supporter centric but often databases haven't got that message. Yes, we'll do it, whatever supporters want, uh, except when the database can't cope with it. Uh, the next one, and probably the last of the big ones on my list, is the committed supporters priesthood. So the danger is you say to somebody, become a member, and it's membership in particular this applies to, and they feel they're somehow joining up to some club that really says they're, they're uh, uh, committed. Now, the most obvious example of that is uh, political parties. You only join uh, a political party if you are sure that you sign up to all their values. But you can also have ones for illnesses as well. Do you become a, um, a member of Diabetes UK if you've just got a little bit? And maybe it says a bit too much to become a member about how ill you think yourself as being. Uh, and then the last one, which is uh, less of an issue than it used to be, but the uh, is it OK to suggest for three pounds a month uh, the world will change? Uh, some people worry about that. I worry about it less than others. But those are some of the issues that when you look at committed supporter offerings, you need to think about and worry about. So what are the ingredients for a committed giving strategy? When you begin to think about it, when you have a clean sheet of paper, what should you be doing and how should you be doing it? Well, how much do people need to give and what are you uh, wanting to do with them? Who's the target audience uh, for any uh, uh, scheme of that kind? Uh, and the danger again is a lot of charities will say, but it's everybody, you know, um, or it's families. Or, so membership tends to go by you're an individual or you're a family or, or you're a couple or whatever. But actually it doesn't go. What we're looking for is the 35 to 55 year old. Uh, people with, with a, a net income of over this and so on. Charities, by and large, I would argue, aren't great about the cleared uh, audience demographics or attitudinal demographics that they want to get. What feedback or benefits do people want in return for committing? 
Uh, and again, if you're going to have different audiences, you may need to have different uh, feedback mechanisms. You may, may need to say, okay, for this audience, what we really need to get uh, is this kind of magazine because these people are particularly interested uh, in, in, in the particular nuances, the real uh, detail, and these people want much more of an ideological approach. It depends on what, who you are and what your committed giving scheme is all about. The motivations why people would want to join are particularly important. And that's why the difference, for example, between benefits-led membership uh, and uh, uh, kind of uh, beliefs-led membership is so important. If people are joining for benefits, then they need to be clear what the benefits are. If people are joining because they really support you and who you are and what you're doing, then understanding that difference is really important. If you get the two muddled up, people may say, you're trying to give us benefits when actually there aren't any. Uh, and feel a little bit short changed. If, if, if the National Trust is very hard to beat when it comes to great value. So are you really going to get better value than that? Some schemes may have a voting or a constitutional role. If you're a member of the RSP, RSPCA, you will get to vote in their elections, um, but they will also have a committed giving scheme as well. Uh, what encourages people to stay or increase their commitment? Uh, so again, that may be something as the, simple as the direct debit, the annual renewal cycle, telling people what they're doing. Uh, I once listened to a very good uh, talk by a, a man who said, you need to have the psychology of going across the threshold. A committed giving scheme is all about you get people to go through the threshold and then they know they've joined and they know they've done their bit. Now that doesn't necessarily align with the wanting them to increase it. So how do you get people to increase that commitment? Uh, in the old days, we used to ring them up. We used to ring them up. I remember getting rung up by WWF and saying, you give us uh, £21 a month already, sir. Uh, and their algorithm, poorly tuned as it was, clearly said, ask people for three times what they give. So they asked me if I'd give £63 a month. Now, actually, we don't get telephone fundraising anymore uh, to do those kind of things because so few people have said yes to it under GDPR. But what are you doing to encourage people to stay? And what are you doing to encourage people to increase their commitment? And then how is the scheme branded and packaged and marketed? It's actually quite hard to find some decent three pounds a month branded schemes at the moment. The sort of uh, white label version of membership, we tend to call them all the membership. And I think that's a real problem because I think there's a market out there for non-membership committed branded products, but actually not enough of them going. And it's particularly important in a world where what we're seeing is people not necessarily wanting to get mailings every month, but organizations wanting them to give every month. Uh, and those two don't necessarily work uh, particularly well together. So what are the tests then for any uh, new committed giving product? Well, first of all, if you're going to look about creating a new product, is it viable at low volumes? Uh, if you're going to create a 48 page magazine and you've only got 100 people, it ain't going to work very well. Are you very clear at your success internally? Um, uh, you know, are you getting a, th a thousand people, 500 people, 10,000 people uh, and are the commitments clear and you're providing reasons for people to increase? So, um, again, I would encourage people to say, you know, this is something which could be about time. It could be about campaigning. It could be about money. Um, the currency of money is much easier to measure than the currency of giving time or campaigning. Uh, and then is the target audience clear? Um, I think it's much better to say these are the kinds of people we attract. Uh, and people um, often come to us and we do re research for people to try and help them reach new audiences. And if you want to reach new audiences, you probably can't do it with the same audience, the same uh, committed giving product as with what you've got at the moment. So if you want to reach new audiences, you may need a different kind of committed giving product. It's a bit like when you go to the supermarket and you decide what kind of things do you need to wash your clothes. And they have hundreds of products. They need to help you understand which one is right for you. In the same way, if you're going to have multiple giving, committed giving offerings, you need, need people to be helped to understand which one is the right one for them. Can participants increase their contribution without friction? I effectively was arguing earlier that to give more to the RSPB or National Trust is a fairly friction-filled uh, activity. It's not very easy to give more to those organizations, uh, and I think it should be. Is the participant in control of what they see, receive? Can their the database simply say, yeah, I would like two copies of the magazine a year and not four, or I don't necessarily need the handbook because actually, my wife already gets it, my dad always gives it to me or whatever else it may be. Uh, does the product provide contribution equality for giving time or money or energy? Is volunteering seen to be as valuable to you as giving money? Uh, and is the product scalable with success? 
if you're going to say to everyone, come and visit um, uh, uh, one of our places, come to an open day, uh, come to hear what we're doing, come and have webinars like this. Uh, my local wildlife trust has webinars and they seem to be instantly full. So they've done a good job of encouraging people uh, to join and get the benefit of webinar, but within an hour of signing up, it's full, which isn't a great indicator that their, uh, their, their, their product is scalable with success. So that uh, whiz through um, some of the, the things that I think are going on. Uh, and what I would also say is we are developing this presentation. And if any of you would like uh, me to come and talk to your organization with a bit more um, time and a, a few more case studies and examples, be very happy to do that. Uh, but I hope you found that whiz through um, committed giving and some of the issues that uh, bundled up in developing a committed giving strategy uh, in, in about 20 um, uh, minutes or so. Uh, so sorry for rushing for it and I hope you found that useful. Thanks Joe. I think we're a little bit um, further on in time than, than we'd like to, but if anyone has any questions uh, you could type it into the chat or uh, stick up your hand and hopefully we'll be able to, to see you. Uh, okay, I'm not seeing anything, but if you would like to, to put it into the chat, then maybe we can uh, have a look at that after the next presentation. Okay, so I am very excited to introduce our next speaker. This is James Beebe. He's Director of Ed, uh, Income Generation at Darren Sickens Trust. James is going to talk about a piece of work, including existing and potential support work that we helped THT with about I think, two years ago, um, and how Darren Sickens Trust have used that work to inform their audience development. So I'll hand you over to James. Thanks, Kian. Um, right, I'll just try and get my presentation up and share the screen. I'll just take that to full screen. There we go. So hopefully everyone can see that okay. Um, so I'm just going to talk through how we've worked with NFP Synergy and, and what we've done since then. And, and I guess kind of as I was writing this presentation, I was just thinking about before we embarked upon that work, what were some of the things that would have been helpful for me to know um, and some of the decision points, as I think will probably become painfully obvious to all of you as I go through the presentation. I'm not a data person. Um, I, um, you know, I lead our fundraising team. I enjoy putting strategies together. I enjoy trying to deliver growth with teams um, and I enjoy thinking about audiences, but, but data is not my, is, is not my bag. Um, and for me, that was one of the scariest things about embarking upon any kind of segmentation that I was all of a sudden going to be absolutely deluged in a ton of data and not know what to do with it. But more importantly, how to make the segmentation be something that we could practically use. So I'm kind of almost positioning this as it's going to start to feel like a bit of an idiot's guide to, to how to implement fund, uh, fundraising segmentation. But hopefully that will be quite useful because I know before I started, it felt quite intimidating. Um, so just to tell you a little bit about um, my organisation. So I work at THT, um, which is the leading HIV and sexual health charity in the UK. Um, and THT was born out of activism for the AIDS crisis in the, particularly in the 80s. In fact, next year is 40th, it's the 40th anniversary of THT um, and 40 years since um, Terry Higgins died. He was one of the first people to die of AIDS in the UK. Um, and the organisation, as I said, was set up by activists in his memory. And first of all, it was about supporting people who are living with AIDS. And luckily, well, not luckily, actually, because a lot of work went into it, but fortunately, that work is as much now around stopping HIV transmission completely, because we have the tools to do it, um, as it is around supporting people who are living with. And HIV is now a lifelong condition. For, for most people who have it that is not going to cause really any great issues um, and people living with HIV now can live as, as long and normal a life as if they weren't living with HIV. And so that does, whilst that's obviously an amazing thing, that does obviously present us with a bit of an identity issue because THT was always there in response to a crisis but we're no longer in a crisis but we've still got a job to do to support people and stop transmission. Alongside that, we also do a lot of work in sexual health. And whilst HIV is a part of sexual health, 
um, very often they they are looked at separately and, and so we needed to think about how those two parts of our work fit together in the public consciousness. Before THT I worked at Prostate Cancer UK, um, obviously a men's cancer charity um, and I was there for uh, just over seven years um, and I'd say over the last five, four or five of those we did see huge growth and a big part of that was through a new approach that we were taking towards audiences, particularly taking the engagement approach where we were looking at our audiences as you know, people who would help to deliver all of the strategy, be that receiving or giving of a service or value or money or whatever, as opposed to just looking at someone being a donor, someone being a beneficiary, someone being a volunteer. But there were challenges for us in doing that, particularly when we did segmentation. And I think we struggled, and I think they, they, they have gone on to struggle a bit with how once they've got the segmentation, and I'll refer to that a bit later as to what it looked like, how it could be used and how that could be used to drive forward decisions, particularly around products and messaging. So when I joined THT, which is just over two years ago in January 2019, um, I always say if I if I knew some at the time some of the things that I found out since I may not have I may not have joined the organization because it was there was quite a big job that needed to be done to drive fundraising forward. We had an organizational strategy which didn't really match our work. So we weren't able to say, here's our strategy and here's you know, the different things that we're doing that are going to deliver it. Um, there was, as I've talked about, this tension between HIV and AIDS and sexual health. Our messaging was, and, and still is to a degree, a bit all over the place. On the one hand, we were saying to people, HIV is nothing to be feared. You know, it's no longer a death sentence and you can live a perfectly normal, happy, healthy life if you are living with HIV. But on the other hand, we want to stop the transmission of HIV because, um, you know, we still don't want people to be getting it. We think that we can eradicate HIV transmission, but to get people to support that, you've got to say why it's important to stop it. We have to be able to give a case. Um, and so what we're finding is that people said, we're saying to us, we don't really know what your organisation stands for anymore. So we'd had some very distinct audiences that we would have been talking to, and we have lost our way a bit with those people. Um, I found that the team was underdeveloped, it hadn't been invested in, teams were working very much in silos with loads of different communications, not in, in any kind of uh, uniformity. And we didn't know who our audiences were anymore. So the first steps were I put a bit of a plan in place, a development plan in place for fundraising, just working with teams about the things very internal that needed to change. So nothing was changing externally yet. Really thinking internally about how we were going to move some of these forward things forward and really nuts and bolts things like getting sign off sorted and um, how we were um, briefing people and support care and and we were looking for quick wins for growth, but there weren't many. So it became really obvious to me that we had to wait until we had proper audience research in place before we were going to be able to drive growth forward. So we set about audience research within a couple of months. And I think that is as Keen says about two years ago now. That process took from, I think we went out to the competitive pitch in probably around this time of year um, uh, in the spring, and we were only getting to the end of it at Christmas. So it was a big, long piece of work, but we did do a really robust piece of work. But I think one of the big things that I decided to do at that point, a few months in, I was like, okay, I've got to dig deep in. I've got to dig deep here, except this isn't a quick fix, except I'm here for the long haul, and I'm gonna to have to be really patient with all of this. And so, and if anyone is thinking about doing audience research, I'd say, don't just do it in isolation. Look at the different strategic things you might need to drive forward as well and, and link it to those because audience research done properly can help you to really drive forward different elements of strategy. And I think I'll go on in a bit to demonstrate what that looks like. So working with NFP Synergy, um, they came very strongly recommended. Um, a previous colleague had said and this may not float everyone's boat um, um, and I don't mean it li quite literally but they said they'll just put your arms around you and make it work and what really did work for us with with NFP is that they didn't just approach it by saying and no one's paid me to say this by the way they didn't just approach it from the point of view of saying 
okay, here's the small thing or the, you know, the, the, the challenge that you've asked us to work with and we're not going to deviate from that. We won't look outside of that. They took a very holistic um, interest in the organisation and about how this is going to drive different things forward. And that was part of the big appeal for me. Um, it was a very practical and easy to follow approach. And we then put them through a competitive pitch. And there were lots of different people who wanted to do different things um, that some agencies were saying, um, I mean, one agency came along and said, you can do 12 interviews with just, you know, individuals and you, we can analyze that data. But we didn't have any information at all. And we were very nervous about doing that. Some people were saying, do focus groups first and then we'll go and do a survey. But we felt quite strongly we needed to go to a broad range of people first and then drill it down and then define what we were finding through focus groups. Um, and we went backwards and forwards on this, but in the end we decided that was the right approach. Um, and the team we were working with at NFP really helped us just to kind of refine our thinking around that and to make sure we got an approach that was going to work for where we were at that particular time. We really did have no assumptions, no audiences. Um, you know, there was stuff from a very long time ago, but we weren't sure if we just needed to just walk away from all of that. So we decided a survey followed by focus groups was the best way. Um, so what we wanted to get out of this and, what, and how we're using it now was to give us a brief as to how we were gonna develop new fundraising initiatives. So a product has to meet the audience. Um, you know, and, and products fail because they're not right for the audience. So before we went and put anything else out there, we needed to know who are we talking to? Who cares about what we do and is going to want to support it? Um, and then once we've identified them, what are the reasons that they care and what are the reasons that they want to give? It's really important to understand why they're supporting you and then how they want to hear about it. So really helping us with messaging. Um, we needed to know which bits of our work different people were interested in supporting. As I said, we've got parts of our work around stopping HIV transmission, bits are around helping people to live well with HIV and um, other parts around sexual health, which, which were going to be the audiences that we could sell which bits of work to. And we got that through it. So the questionnaire that we came up with working with NFP was really, really important because we had to make sure it was going to tell us these things at the end of it and it, we spent a lot of time on it and it was really really worth it but at the end as I've said we needed to get something that was going to be very practical um, and there's a couple of types I mean there's probably way more than this um, uh, of segmentation you have one that's, that, that splits people out by their attitudes and what they think and that might not be connected to you it just might be what drives them as individuals or you know, uh, Prostate Cancer UK, we had our segmentation was based on whether people were driven emo by emotions and stats, of, uh, sorry, emotions and feelings or stats and facts or stories. Um, or is it going to be demographic? And so based on your age, um, for us, sexual orientation, your gender, your ethnicity, where you live, etc. And your cause drives that, or it did for us. So as I said, this is the focus, this is the process we went through. Um, so a survey first, um, which we put out to our database, plus we tried to recruit um, cold people through our social media channels. And then we did, we recruited for focus groups in places where, um, you know, THT had got, well, not necessarily where THT had got key support, but once we got the audiences where we felt we were gonna find the people who sit, sat within those audiences. So for us, that was London, Brighton and Glasgow. And we wanted to find out from people who they are, so all that demographic stuff, what they cared about, life generally, but, but also in connection to our work and how they wanted to get involved. And we did filter them down. So we assumed that we were probably unlikely. So we put some questions in just to sort of wheat from the chaff a bit, really. We assumed that um, if you didn't support LGBT rights, you were very unlikely to support an HIV charity. So that was a filter question we applied at the start. So I've talked a bit about how we kind of made a decision about what kind of segmentation we'd go with. And it's important just to give a bit of a background on, on HIV and AIDS. Um, so um, it, 
<laughs> sorry, my picture has has actually gone over one of the key words on this. HIV AIDS disproportionately affected gay men, um, so uh, MSN men who have sex with men and um, black. Uh, communities, in particular um, uh, uh, people from Black African communities. Um, and treatment for it, when it stopped effectively being a death sentence, although there are people around from pre-96 who diagnosed pre-96, um, treatment became widely available in 1996. So the relationship people tend to have towards HIV is very different after those points, um, because there were much worse outcomes pre-1996 as to afterwards. I mean, basically, it's quite binary. People tended not to survive or people did survive and it became a lifelong condition and treatment has got better and better and better and better. Equally, the history, because of the, the, the disproportionate um, uh, amount of uh, um, gay men or men who have sex with men uh, who have been affected by HIV AIDS, the history of LGBT rights is very closely connected to it. So for us, it became very much about demographics. Um, I think it was Kean actually who did the, the analysis on the, on, the, on the results of the survey when it came out. Um, I'm no statistician as, uh, again, it's probably obvious, but what they'll do is look for, when you cluster the data in different ways, how, what are some of the defining things that makes your data look different? So Prostate Cancer UK, as I said, it was that feelings that people had. This is how I like to receive information and this is what motivates me. And that was where we saw the groups become really distinct. Here, it was flat. That wasn't showing any distinct groups at all. Everyone looked the same. When we looked at demographics, however, it was very distinct. So it became for us about those four things, sexual orientation, age, gender and ethnicity. And I think the thing there is, it's not just about who they are, it's about why this matters to people. And that's what's really important here. Um, so what part of our work can we then align with those groups? What do they care about making a difference towards? Um, and we also saw that what HIV AIDS was, was coming out, you know, much, much, more motivating, but there is one group, sexual health is, is quite key as well. So it was a bit of a big choice for us. And when you do a segmentation, there will come a point at which a load of data will be presented back to you and a load of choices you'll be offered to make. And it's really important to get the senior leadership of your organization involved at that stage because for us, there had been a big debate going around for a very long time. Is THT basically a gay people's organization? Um, and this was really a really strategic point for us, a really strategic decision for us to make. Um, and we decided at that point, we felt we could get much more support by quickly, by targeting the LGBT population and, and, and two segments of it. But there were another two audiences where we think we've got the opportunity to do more, but we're going to be a bit longer term. But it was totally vital to get everyone on board. And we also accepted that we might be going to the LGBT audiences and saying, we want you to help all people affected by HIV and AIDS. And they may not be LGBT and they may be heterosexual, they may be, um, they may be black or obviously you have black LGBT people. Um, and so it's, 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 it's not just saying you're a group of people and we want you to only help um, people within your own community. And so these four audiences emerged. Um, so two LGBT audiences and really it is mainly male within those audiences. One below, uh, so one above 45 and one below 45. Um, and the difference there is that that 45 year old age group um, broadly aligns with people who are becoming uh, adults at around 1996. So older than that, people have a very different experience of what HIV AIDS meant. Um, and younger than that, um, it's, 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 it's generally more positive. Um, with black African um, population or, or black community, um, obviously there's more of an international angle. Um, and with the female 45 to 54 audience, um, what we saw there was there was a very strong link to sexual health but driven by mainly being um, parents and wanting their kids to have access to good sexual health information. 
Um, loads of people knew who we were. Not a lot of people knew what we did. So we knew there was something really clear that we had to do. We had to state really solidly, here is our belief now. Now, the great thing is, is that we've been working on our strategic focus for over the next 10 years, and we've got a 10 year ambition to stop HIV transmission by 2030. So that was coming up alongside, um, and that's been something we've been able to communicate really effectively with, uh, with people. People were very warm to us, but the vast majority within those groups that we identified hadn't supported us. So that, that hypothesis that basically all the gay people who were going to support THT had already done it and were, you know, they've moved on, that didn't stand water, that didn't hold water. Um, there was a lot, there is still a lot of opportunity um, and we're, we're, we're focusing on that at the moment. Equally, it's really important to understand that our, our services and our beneficiary-led work is going to a much broader population. And you don't have to be as equitable in fundraising as you do in service delivery. Um, there is, cutting through all of it, there is strong support for sexual health services, but a lot of people felt it should be delivered by the NHS and there is strong su support for us helping people to live well with HIV. So I need probably need to rattle through the, the next couple of bits. So um, what came next? Um, so um, NFP produced um, really fantastic data packs and pen portraits with us. We had induction days with the team to help really bring the audiences to life. And we started thinking about what initial products we could develop. And there was a whole raft of them that we were thinking through. Um, but one of the key decisions that we needed to make was how we were gonna use this. So, you know, we've already had a decision about who the audience is. Because it's demographic, we've got a key decision on how we're gonna use it. The reason it was a decision is what you wanna do is get this information stored in your database. So basically every time you've got a support, you can put them in a little box. And when you pull off the data, it pulls it off in that box. But we're dealing with very sensitive data here. Um, and so there's GDPR issues about collecting a lot of it. Um, a lot of people won't give it. And we can't put proxies in place. You know, we can't say because someone has responded to it X, we can assume they're a gay person over 45, um, as you can do with attitudinal stuff. So we kind of decided that was a little bit of a red herring and we were going to hold off. But what we did do, what we have been doing is saying we can use this very much in terms of marketing, uh, sorry, developing our products. So really using the research that we've got to develop new things. But the other good thing about a demographic um, segmentation, you might not be able to have it in the database, but you can buy it on Facebook. Um, so on social, we were able to buy against those groups. Um, and we've then been digging deeper and finding other things that, that you know, fit within those audiences. And we've been finding that our digital targeting has, been, targeting has been getting better and better and better. So I would say before you make any decisions about what your audiences are gonna look like, think of how you're gonna use it. Think of how, you know, involve your database team on that and really get them to think about how practical it's gonna be. Involve your digital team as well. Because when we had an attitudinal survey at Prostate Cancer UK, our big thing was, well, we can't go and find these people because we don't know what they look like. We know what they think, but we can't. We can't buy them. Um, I'll rattle to the end now. Um, we were doing loads and loads of this development um, when the pandemic hit um, about a year ago and a lot of investment in our organisation was just put on hold. But we have used a lot of it to drive stuff forward in the meantime. So we've been really working to uh, move forward in the interim our messaging around our DM programme and we've been seeing way better results. So we've been getting much better average gifts and response rates. Um, we have moved forward a walking programme, which is one of the key things that came out um, with a successful pilot. We know that people wanted to know more about the impact and about the history of HIV. So we had um, a quiz as data capture recently, um, which was on the back of It's a Sin. Um, and that in the space of a couple of weeks generated about 3000 leads for us. Um, we've also put an innovation process in place. And the good thing is we were expecting our income to drop last year or the year we've, we've just come out of. Um, we've actually been able to keep our income at the same level. In fact, some areas, our direct marketing, for instance, um, income has risen last year. Um, our, um, our regular giving, we've been able to increase. Our cash giving, we've been able to increase. And we're back on a growth path for this year. And I think having those audiences very clearly defined is a big part of that for us. Um, so loads of stuff happening this year. Um, we know our audiences love going to the theatre and dining in. Um, so we're going to be doing pilots around that. We're going to be um, trying a pilot around regular giving. So um, value exchange. 
for parents. So offering people um, within that 35 to 54 female audience um, sexual health guides as to how they can talk to their kids, which is one of the key things that came out of the research. We're going to pilot that this year. Um, looking at um, pilots within the, within the black audience and so working with our outreach teams on that to look at what we want to do. Um, working on corporate engagement and we've we've nearly finished our messaging framework using all of all of the stuff that we found to actually have a really clear organizational way of talking to our audiences that is fully joined up so i'll wrap up um so in a nutshell what do i think segmentation can do it might tell you things you already knew we did have a bit of a moment where we got the data back and we got the initial findings back and we went oh yeah that's not really a surprise is it um but we had gone round and round in circles debating some of this stuff and there was always opinions on the table, whereas now we have facts. So if you've got something you can't agree on in terms of who your target audiences should be, this will help. And, and you know, put those decisions and those hypotheses in at the start to test them. Um, it means we're being much more unapologetic in our targeting. So we don't mind if we're putting things out and it just looks like it's skewing towards particular audiences because that's the point we have got a really clear language about how we talk about our audiences and when we're developing anything we think about it very clearly and our whole calendar for the year and our whole business planning process have been done through the lens of those four audiences as i said our digital targeting is getting better than ever and we're seeing much better metrics in terms of um, a lot of our uh, delivery in terms of our direct marketing so it would be uh, wrong of me to say that it can give you everything that you need, but it will give you a lot. Um, and for fundraising and leading fundraising forward, it's given me a strategic direction to take things in, um, to tell you things that you might have assumed, but not been able to back up and to be able to look at your programme and see what's missing and help you to know what you need to put in there. So that's it from me. Um, I would be really happy to take any questions now, but also if um, anyone wanted to um, get in touch afterwards, um, I'm happy for um, Kim to share my email address if anyone wanted to just um, pick brains just in parts of that as to how we drove it forward. Um, but yeah, I think that is, that's everything from me. Fantastic. Thanks so much for sharing that, James. I think a really, really interesting overview of the, the project and a, a great one to work on from, from our perspective as well. So delighted to hear that it's been um, a success so far. And yeah, every success as well for when you can get things back online and do those theatre and dining own uh, projects, which sound absolutely fascinating and even more exciting uh, in the current circumstances. So did anyone have any questions they'd like to ask uh, James now? Or if not, uh, as James said, of course, very happy to, to share details afterwards. Okay, uh, doesn't look like it. Um, thanks very much, James. So our, our last presentation, and apologies that we are running a little bit over, but I, I hope you can stay um, because it's something we're really excited about. Um, Katerina Zister is our final presenter. She's a researcher at NFP Synergy and she's going to be showing us a really interesting project that she's been working on, which is our Supporter Insight Benchmark Dashboard. Uh, the motivation behind this project really was that we've run a lot of support surveys for a lot of different uh, clients working in a lot of different areas over the last number of years. Um, and always the challenge has been to say, okay, 75% of people are satisfied with being your supporter. What does that mean in context? Uh, and trying to give a real context and meaning uh, behind those supporter uh, results has been something we've been working on for a long time. So with that in mind, Katerina has sort of not only combined all of these different projects uh, into one um, database of, of, of uh, results, but she's also created an interactive dashboard that our clients can use to explore their results um, and put them into a, a real useful context to give meaning to their scores outside of the isolation of, of one survey alone. Um, so it's a really fascinating project. Um, I'm going to stop talking now. I'm going to hand you over to Katerina, who's going to take you through uh, the findings from a, a real life example. Yeah, thanks, Kane. I'm going to share my screen with the dashboard. 
Okay. Yeah, as Ken said, we do ask a lot of different questions in our supporter surveys, and um, they range from motivation, as James said, to demographics, um, satisfaction, length of support, um, actual support, which are the methods of giving that um, supporters choose. And I have created this dashboard um, to compare one example charity that we have anonymized against the benchmark data that Kian spoke about. And I will show you a couple of those slides on demographics, the loyalty and support. And um, yeah, I will start with age, with demographics. And um, we often hear clients say that they have um, a rather old database, that their supporters are older than 50 years. And when we do research with them, we actually find um, that their supporters are much older than they think. Um, in our benchmark, 65, 66% of supporters were older than 65 years, and only 28% um, are in the age range between 45 and 64. And as I said, we're going to compare against an example charity. And for this charity, the difference was even bigger. So 86% said they were 65 or older, but only 12% said they were 45 to 64. So it's good to um, get this as a result to know, um, first of all, what is your the age of your supported database, um, but also then to compare it to other organizations and to see if you need to um, invest more into finding younger supporters, for example. But then what do um, supporters actually think about your organization? We do ask questions about how satisfied they are, um, if they think they're, you're one of their favorite um, organizations and how long they have supported you. And that's something that Kian mentioned. He said, um, maybe one of our clients gets a result back that is 75% um, say of their supporters say that they are very or quite satisfied with how a charity looks after them as a supporter, which is a good result. But then it is important, again, to compare it against a benchmark average. And our benchmark average actually shows that um, 75% of supporters say they are very or quite satisfied. So if, if an organization wants to do better than that, it, it would have to be even higher than 75%, um, which for this example charity is actually true. 83% um, said they are very or quite satisfied. And we have included another feature into this dashboard. Um, that allows our clients to compare um, different groups um, by filtering out what they're interesting in, interested in. And we have included filters on age, gender, and social grade um, for this dashboard, but we could actually filter it by anything, by different segments of supporters or by different uh, methods of giving, whatever um, is of interest. And I just want to show you how it works. So um, as I said, for our example charity, 61% said they are very satisfied with the organization, but for males, this drops down to um, 56%, whereas for females, this is higher. So this is just an example of what um, the dashboard can do. You can um, compare different groups and then you will not have to look at lists of data tables, you can just compare it um, on the dashboard and you will have it in a chart, which for many people, I think is just easier to see and to understand the results. And let's go on to another question. Another question we ask is, um, compared to other charities that you have supported or that you support at the moment, is Charity X um, your favorite charity or one of your top charities? And um, again, for the benchmark, 60% said it's one of their top charities. So if you want to have a very good result, um, it has to be more than 60% of your supporters saying that, which for our example charity was the case again, um, 80% said that <clears throat> this charity X was either their top charity or one of their top charities. And I want to show you another filter, this time by age. So if you filtered by age, and you look at the um, age of people older than 65, you won't see a lot of 
um, different um, percentages because, of course, as I said before, most of the benchmark is made up of people who are older than 65. But let's look at a different age group, a younger age group this time, um, 25 to 34. And um, you will see the sample size is, is a lot lower than it was before because only few supporters are in this age group. But what we can see is that um, the rating of your, my favorite charity has increased from 16% to 37%. So um, this is, I think, an interesting result for our example charity that um, even though they have lots of older supporters, older than 65, it is good for them to invest into younger audiences that are very enthusiastic about their organization. And <clears throat> that's a similar thing we see when we look at um, length of support. So in the benchmark, if we ask people, how long have you been a supporter of a charity? Um, around a third say they have been supporting a, a charity for more than 10 years. Um, and almost another third say they have been um, starting to support this charity in the last three years. But for example, charity, this is quite different and the split is even bigger. Um, so almost half say that they have been supporting um, our charity X for more than 10 years, um, but only 90% say they have become a recent supporter in the last three years. So I think what that shows is that this charity is doing really well um, maintaining loyal supporters, but it could do more in finding new supporters, engaging, involving um, new supporters. And then finally, how do um, supporters actually choose to support um, charities? That's an interesting um, question we ask usually in our supporter benchmark. And for our example charity, we see that 92% said they donated money in the last um, three months, which um, you would think is a good result. And then let's compare it to the benchmark. And, and it really is a good result. So 92% um, are giving money. The, um, the percentages for volunteering and campaigning for our example charity um, are lower than the benchmark. But then it also depends on how much does this charity want uh, people to volunteer or campaign or is donating money what they're looking for? And, um, and that's the next thing that we ask usually in our benchmark. We ask them, how do you choose to give? Um, so everyone who said they donated, how did they choose to give or how do they choose to give? And for our example charity, we can see that um, many said, I'm making a donation online, um, I give by direct debit or standing order or at a charity shop or through um, a collection tin or bucket. And then if you go further down on the list, you will see that fewer people say that they're going to or taking part in a fundraising event and fewer people remember the charity in their will, which I think is something that you would expect, of course, but then again, it's good to have the benchmark to compare how supporters of other charities respond to this question. And let's do that. So <clears throat> if you look at it, fewer people in the benchmark say they are making a donation online, but more have said they um, do have a standing order. And also more have said that they are going to or taking part in a fundraising event or have remembered a charity in their will. So this is again, important and good for um, charities to compare how um, they're doing compared to um, other organizations. And, and I think that's what our example charity should take from this, that they have um, a very satisfied and loyal supporter base, but that their supporters um, are older than the average benchmark and fewer supporters have joined them over the last three years compared to the benchmark. So they should think about how they can get involved with younger supporters and yeah, ha have new supporters sign up to them year on year rather than only maintaining um, their loyal supporters. 
Um, yeah, so this was just a very quick overview over the dashboard. And as I said, we do ask many questions um, and those are just a couple, um, but our clients do get a link to their own dashboard and then they can um, cut the data in any way they want, use the filter and export the charts that they can generate on the spot into a PowerPoint presentation. So we think it's like a much more pleasant way of presenting the data rather than having tons and tons of data tables. Great, thanks a lot, Katarina. Um, yeah, and if you are someone who has done, uh, for example, the supporter survey with us recently and you don't have access to this, which is everyone who has done such a survey, um, please do get in touch and we'll set you up with one. Um, if you're interested in finding out more about this and how you could do a survey with your supporters and therefore compare your results to our benchmark average, let us know as well. We'd, we'd love to talk to you about that. Um, we've done tons and tons of supporter surveys over the year. They're not all in there yet, but we'll be building that up over time. And so this is only going to get more and more useful the, the more stuff we add into it. Um, yeah, so thanks a lot, Katarina. Does anyone have any questions uh, on that? Either in the chat or um, just raise your hand or just shout. No, I'm not seeing anyone. Um, okay, in that case, thank you all very much for, uh, for joining us today. I think it's been a really interesting session. Um, some great speakers. Uh, my apologies, we've run over a little bit, but if you do have anything you'd like to say or any comments or questions on, on any of the, um, the, the presentations we've had today, just give us a shout uh, and we can either answer them or we, we can put you in touch with James um, if, if you'd like to talk to him. Great. Um, thank you all very much and I will hopefully see you all soon.